Welcome to SPF Vancouver. Thank you for braving the rain. <laughs> Seems like atmospheric rivers happen more often now. Thank you for joining us for the eighth annual Sustainable Production Forum. I'm Melanie Wendell, the Executive Director of the Sustainable Entertainment Society. I'm thrilled to join you today at the VIF Center so we may immerse ourselves in arts and science in sustainability and decarbonization, in connection, storytelling, and hope. Before we dive in, allow me to humbly acknowledge that we are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. As allies in the ongoing battle against climate change, we stand united, determined to preserve and protect the land, to be stewards of its natural gifts and to facilitate healing. This commitment echoes the enduring spirit of the indigenous peoples who have safeguarded this land for countless generations. Today we have an incredible lineup of guests and programming. <clears throat> and I extend my deep gratitude to our SPF Vancouver presenting partners, Real Green and Creative BC, excuse me, <clears throat> and our lead partners, GreenSpark Group, CBC Radio Canada, and Telefilm Canada. Let's watch some key messages from our partners. job at CBC Radio Canada to report on what we as Canadians care about. Politics, culture, sports, entertainment. But there's a bigger picture, something Canadians care about even more, the environment. It's what all the rest of it hinges on. We wouldn't be here without forests, wildlife, and oceans. Stories on the environment often have a way of making us feel powerless and small. Who are we against a hurricane? Who are we against a wildfire? Who are we against a changing climate? We are more powerful than it seems. So we're not just going to report on the environment. We're going to take action and help preserve all the things we care about. We've looked at how we can do better and set some goals for 2026. And that's just the beginning. Our ultimate goal is carbon neutral. As we move towards zero, we will report on our progress. Keeping you informed is our job, after all. Telefilm Canada champions independent storytelling in Canada that is sustainable and inclusive. We are inspired by Indigenous creators on the value of connecting story, land and language and of protecting our natural world. Our commitment is to work through the lens of sustainability in all we do. As an investor, a promoter, a financial administrator and as an employer. We will make positive change and reduce our impact by encouraging knowledge sharing, working in partnership with the industry to implement best practices, establishing science-based targets, and measuring our carbon footprint. With tools like our modernized budget template that now includes sustainability and EDI priorities and our sustainability plan template requirement, we strive to encourage sustainable productions. Together, we can build a sustainable and future-facing film industry.
Thank you. Some housekeeping. Today's workshops will be held in the education suite, which is on the second floor. And so when we get to that time, there will be some folks there to help guide your way. And also you can join us for the Clean Energy Series activations in the Studio Theatre and just outside the VIF entrance on Seymour Street. And those will be uh, getting started at noon. Please tag us, hashtag SPF23, hashtag Sustainable Production Forum if you happen to share anything on social media. And don't forget to download the Swap Card app to maximize your networking experience and getting the most out of today. So first up, our virtual messages. C. Swice, indigenous matriarch of the Squamish, Stolo, and Hawaiian people will share a traditional welcome with us. And then we'll hear from the Honorable Minister Guibault and the Parliamentary Secretary Bob Deeth. And then we'll be joined by our distinguished speakers for opening remarks, Zena Harris, President, GreenSpark Group, Lauren Davis, Director, Program Modernization, Telefilm Canada, and Prem Gill, CEO, Creative BC. Welcome. Welcome to the Sustainable Production Forum. Hath squile, each tenoyup, toits tenat quien quenchaman, cis quien sna, and hath in squalowin, and wanoxed in squalowin titsits. Welcome everybody. It lifts my heart to welcome you to these ancestral lands and waters of the Huamathquiam, the Tislewatooth, and the Skolmish Old Olkameo. I am Skolmish and Stalo. And I'm standing on these shorelines where the salt water meets the shoreline and, and comes back into the forest with ancient trees, ancient cedar trees, ancient fir trees, and ancient maples. Welcome, Ocean. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Greetings from Ottawa, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person this year. Last year and the year before, I was impressed by the industry's efforts to go green. I know this year's forum is bigger and better than ever, both in Toronto and Vancouver. So first, let me thank Zena Harris and the rest of the organizers. And let me congratulate you for incorporating the forum as a nonprofit earlier this year. That tells me you plan to stick around. Je suis heureux de voir ce forum mettre l'accent sur la façon dont le secteur des arts et du divertissement peut réduire son empreinte carbone. Mais surtout, vous insufflez des approches créatives pour sensibiliser les gens à respecter davantage la planète. Nous avons plus que jamais besoin de compteurs. Des gens créatifs, capables d'expliquer les défis mondiaux d'une manière qui nous motive et nous pousse à agir. C'est un concept maintenant reconnu et discuté à l'international. S'appuyer sur le milieu culturel pour communiquer l'action climatique à travers le cœur des gens. The government of Canada is grateful to have such a compelling ally. It is becoming increasingly clear that we have an issue with climate literacy in Canada. An overwhelming majority of Canadians want climate action, but do not fully understand the broad social consensus that exists. Many, many Canadians are willing to act, but feel their fellow citizens are less inclined to do so. Why is that? Canadians are eager to better understand what actions they can take. Affordable, simple, everyday actions to fight climate change. And they want to know that governments are holding major emitters to account. Your industry has an incredible important platform to help bridge the gap in climate literacy, to connect the scientific reality to human emotions, and to translate data and concepts into empathy and action. Climate impacts are influencing and will continue to influence the bread and butter struggles of Canadians. These are the stories you tell so well. So far, the government has committed more than $120 billion to address climate change and spur clean growth. We've established a plan to achieve our 2030 climate target and lay the foundation for achieving net zero by 2050. This plan is all about healthier communities, reliable and affordable energy, good jobs, and a strong economy. This includes putting in place the many milestones to achieve net zero, such as 
setting new emission standards for vehicles, capping emissions from the oil and gas sector, and reshaping our energy system. Since 2015, We've also invested more than $6.5 billion to help Canadians adapt to climate change at all levels. De plus, nous collaborons avec des partenaires pour garder le plastique dans l'économie et hors de l'environnement, et avec l'aide de plus de 100 organismes fédéraux pour adresser ce problème avec une approche pan gouvernementale. To achieve our goals, it will take engagement by Canadians in all sectors and walks of life, including the world of arts and entertainment, which can benefit from electrification from innovation technologies like hydrogen, and be first adopter of a circular economy. So again, let me thank the Forum for its leadership. May you continue to find creative ways to decarbonize and while telling us stories that inspire us and drive positive change in our society and the world. Thank you. Merci. Hi everybody, my name is Bob Deeth. I'm the Parliamentary Secretary for Arts and Film, and I'm speaking to you today from the territory of the Kwangan speaking people, known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. Thank you so much to the Sustainable Entertainment Society for hosting this event. We're proud to support this event through Creative BC's program funding and the Real Green Initiative. And to you, the filmmakers, crew, producers, vendors, sustainability champions, everyone involved, um, and who's participating in this event, thank you. Ensuring environmental sustainability is crucial. And we all know that climate change affects all of us, as we saw this summer with the force of the wildfires that happened all over. And our hearts go out to the folks in West Kelowna, Kelowna and Shuswap and around the province. And moreover, it's really important to make sure that we take steps to prioritize climate change initiatives and put pressure in place to prepare for, mitigate, and hopefully prevent these types of disasters from happening in the future. In BC, our natural environments are some of our most precious assets, and we're privileged to live on um, some of the most world's most spectacular places with diverse flora and fauna and something that draws production activity to BC. And in BC, we're committed to being leaders in climate change action and uh, sustainable practices that protect uh, sensitive um, environments. In fact, addressing climate uh, change and the climate emergency for a better future is ingrained in everything that we do in our government. Um, it's really important to recognize that the province recently announced the largest investment, over $42 million into the creative sector. And one of these investments, uh, it's nearly $16 million, is there to support BC filmmakers, producers, and creators, with a portion of that funding being directed to green initiatives in the motion picture industry. I want to applaud the work the motion picture industry is doing in BC to redu reduce the environmental impact of film production. And because of you, BC is on the map. We're actually a global leader in sustainable production. Thank you for that. And thanks for the advocacy and initiatives that you lead. I'm proud of the amazing work that you're doing through Real Green and other initiatives to move the dial on the sustainability. Thank you for your commitment to sustainable production practice for the industry and our province. Have a wonderful and informative forum. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to SPF 23. Uh, <laughs> yay! <laughs> uh, Seems like we've come full circle. Does this place look familiar to anyone? Uh, those of you who were here way back when um, for, the, for the first forum, it's great to be back at VIF uh, where SPF began. Um, eight years ago, I started a little conference with the big vision to bring together the film and TV industry and advance sustainability. Uh, the longevity of SPF in Vancouver is a testament to the collaboration that BC is known for and the momentum of the BC film industry. We gather here today with more clarity as to what we need to do to transform and evolve into a more sustainable industry. Today, I am proud of the work that SPF has done and how it has evolved. This year, as you've heard a few folks already say, SPF reached a big milestone. Um, it is now uh, 
housed at the Sustainable Entertainment Society, which is a nonprofit organization founded to serve the film and TV industry in this sustainable transition. Its whole purpose is to advance our collective action. And GreenSpark Group is a foundational partner and partner of this, um, of this effort and evolution. And I dare say, even with all the work that has been going on, um, I, I dare say we still, uh, we still have a lot to do. Our work has really just begun. We know, what, we know what's going on and we can see the pathway forward. And the BC film industry has a rich history and a strong foundation for sustainability. But I am reminded of the saying, what got us here will not necessarily be what takes us forward. Our systems will change. They will evolve. Technology will evolve. We're already seeing that happen at a rapid pace. Uh, and the way we work will evolve. So we must constantly remake ourselves to be that much more sustainable next time. And to be more collaborative, to lean in, to uplift all of those who are working to improve the industry. Transformation at times feels uncomfortable. I have felt it in the past. I think we're going through that uh, now. And it may feel <laughs> like those awkward times in middle school uh, or those teenage years. Um, but transform we must. The big ideas, the vision, bold moves are needed in this decisive decade. In my house, I have a newly minted teenage son, and I know all about awkwardness. <laughs> and I want him to have the option to work in a thriving film and TV industry in 10 years when he's at the start of his career, if he so desires. What we do now in the face of climate change will determine the options those seeking careers in film and TV have in the future. So let's make it good. Let's make it bold. <laughs> Here's to the amazing work of the SPF team for seeing the vision for collective action. To all the partners who believe in collective support and who make this gathering happen. It literally could not happen without the partners collaborating on this. And here's to each and every one of you for leaning in, working hard, and showing up for sustainability in the film and TV industry. And here's to transformation. So thank you all, and have a great day. Thanks, Zena. Um, good morning, bonjour à toutes et à tous. I'm Lauren Davis, the Director of Program Modernization at Telefilm Canada. It is really great to be here at the 8th edition of the Sustainable Production Forum in Vancouver. I'm particularly upbeat today because I'm not only looking out at all the champions that showed up today in this miserable weather, um, and I have some positive things to report about Telefilm's eco-awareness survey, but also because this was the first Thanksgiving dinner that I didn't get into an argument with my brother-in-law over the need for climate action. He gets it, so yay. <laughs> Telefilm Canada has been a very proud par partner of this forum since 2021, and we greatly appreciate this platform that shines a light on this priority and the need for us to work together towards a greener and healthier future for the industry. At Telefilm, the work that we do is inspired by Indigenous perspectives, their holistic and inclusive lens, uh, reminding us that story, land, and language are harmoniously intertwined. Since the launch of our Eco Responsibility Action Plan over a year and a half ago, what we've heard from creators was the importance of planning ahead and getting an early start when it comes to being sustainable. And Telefilm is listening by taking a thoughtful and pragmatic approach to better support you and greener practices. One of the practical approaches we implemented is making the sustainability plan mandatory deliverable for all successful applicants receiving telefilm funding. And to facilitate this and support our producers, we created an interactive sustainability plan template 
and also revised our production budget template. These are useful tools that the industry has access to right now. This afternoon, my colleague Deborah Patz and I will be doing a workshop on a practical guide for your sustainability plan at the education suite. So that's my plug. The second iteration of our eco-awareness survey, uh, the results of which will be published soon, has some inspiring results. You've let us know that more of you are benefiting from training on sustainable production practices and that practices are being implemented like recycling and compost programs, followed by reducing waste and repurposing, donating and upcycling. And a quarter of respondents are thinking about working with green vendors and suppliers using carbon calculators, as well as battery power, cleaner tech, and greener transportation options. All hopeful things. We know that implementing change takes collaboration, and I look forward to connecting with you and learning from you throughout the conference. Please enjoy the forum. This is going to be great. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Hi, good morning, everybody. I always have hated this podium. This is my second time at this one in the last couple of weeks. Um, hi, I'm Prem Gill, as you can see, my own picture staring at me. It's a lovely thing. Um, thank you all. Thank you so much, Zena and your team, for bringing us all back together again. Um, I'm very honored to have grown up here on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people and continue to live and work here and uh, be part of this community. So thank you to those people. And I want to um, also congratulate the Sustainable Forum team. It has been uh, impressive to be able to line this up year over year. I was trying to remember, Zena, I think I was there in 2015. Actually, I had just started my job at Creative BC. And I moderated a panel. And that was because I started in October. I think we had it in November. So it is amazing to see that year over year, we all keep coming back together and having these conversations that are so critical and so important. And thank you to our colleagues at Telefilm who've been partners with us in really helping to drive this work forward in the independent production community. It's so critical, that knowledge and experience that is spreading throughout the industry. And it is, it is contagious because uh, we don't have a lot of time here. And I think that the more people that we have that are training and working through these different programs, we are seeing the impacts of that. So thank you very much. Um, I always do this. My team gives me notes and then I get inspired by people who speak before me. And then I'm like, what? What was I going to say? Um, but, uh, you know, thank you all for, you know, being here, for sharing your insights to all of the speakers today. We've seen the impacts as the speakers, you know, Minister Gibo and Parliamentary Secretary Bob Deeth have noted. Um, the initiatives that the industry and CMPA and others are leading around climate storytelling is also an important piece of it. It is both the practical that we are doing to make shifts and changes and transformation, but also how and what are we doing in our storytelling. And I think that is extremely, an extremely important part of this as well. So today there's, you know, the industry trailblazers. There's the work that the committed work that the team at uh, Real Green and MPA and CMPA going back beyond the eight years that is so critical and important. Um, you know, Real Green really started as an industry grassroots initiative, and we've been fortunate to be the stewards of it through Creative BC and to bring along other federal partners, including Telefilm, the CBC, other provinces, Ontario, Quebec, Manitoba, and everybody has joined in. Um, and I think that's a real testament to what the industry has done here. And I know it's been a really challenging and difficult time for so many right now over the last few months uh, with less, less production happening in British Columbia, but know that you are the leaders in this and the world sees you that way. And we certainly are proud of that at Creative BC. And we're really excited that we have the opportunity to hear about some of those things directly from many of you today. Um, I wanna thank the team at Creative BC, Marnie G, Marnie he couldn't be here today, uh, so she sends her regrets, but um, I think I see Julie. I can't really see people, so Julie Bernard um, is here, Smiley Karana. I mean, you probably know Julie because she's our original eco-warrior within Creative BC. Uh, Smiley Karana is going to be on a couple of panels. She's going to um, be sharing a lot of fantastic insights. Matthew Perry is here. He works on the production funding programs. If you're looking for money from Creative BC, he's the person to talk to. Um, 
uh, Peter Klassen is here, and there might be some other folks here from the Film Commission Services. And I do want to recognize those folks are going to be here all day. They're here to connect with you. That networking piece is so important because the more connections and ways we come together, the more we are going to make and affect change together. So thank you. Have a fantastic day. And I look forward to hearing all the amazing things. Thank you. Thank you, Zena, Lauren, and Prem for those in uplifting and inspiring messages I'm so excited about today. So, we are honoured to be joined by Melina Labucan Massimo to deliver this year's keynote address, Sustaining the Sacred, a story of renewal, healing, and a just transition. Melina is a climate and environmental advocate, founder of Sacred Earth Solar, co-founder and Just Transition Director at, Indi at Indigenous Climate Action and a Climate Fellow at the David Suzuki Foundation. She's also the host of the TV series Power to the People, which profiles renewable energy in Indigenous communities. Please help me give a warm welcome to Melina Labucan Massimo. That's my language for introducing myself. I am Cree. It's also known as Cree, but we in our language say Nihiao. And I am from the Lubakong Cree First Nation, born in my community of Little Buffalo, which is in Treaty 8 territory. But I am also honored to be here as a visitor um, on the unceded Coast Salish. Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples. Um, and it's just nice to be here, to be around people that, it feels like two of my worlds are colliding with, um, I've been involved in filmmaking. Um, I think I made my first short film in 2004 and have done that throughout my environmental campaign work. So it's nice to see people that are so interested and meet more people that are interested in these issues. Um, so I'm going to do a PowerPoint because I really enjoy photos. Sometimes it's kind of boring seeing a talking head after a while. So I'm going to bring you along with a lot of photos today. And I'm just getting used to this clicker now. So here we are. SPF 23. Woohoo! <laughs> Yay, we're here together in, in person. It's actually one of my first um, in-persons. I've done a few over the pandemic, but because I'm immunocompromised, I'm often not in public these days. Um, but it's just so nice to be here. And thank you again for having me. Uh, again, I am a co-founder of Indigenous Climate Action and Sacred Earth Solar co-founder. Uh, and those are both two Indigenous-led um, climate organizations that are national across the country. And I'll talk a little bit more about them throughout the um, presentation. Just to locate myself, as most Indigenous peoples do, um, I am from the northern lungs of Mother Earth, the Boreal Forest. And that's the, a part of why I became, I guess, a quote unquote environmentalist or a land defender. Um, that's my cookum, my grandmother, um, before she passed. Um, and her name was Josephine Lebelcan, and that's actually my dad at the very top. He um, was hidden from residential schools. Um, he was hidden by my Kokum and Musa, my grandparents, until the age of nine. Um, he was hidden in the bush on the trap lines because my aunts and uncles, who all went to residential school, were older than him, and so he was, I guess, a lucky one. Um, and he was hidden um, for the close to the first decade of his life, and then eventually went to grade one and had to learn English. In and residential day school. And that's um, my my auntie on the far left, and my sister, and my mom, and my other, and yeah, family members. And I love the Boreal, um, and it's such a beautiful place. But as most of you probably now know, when I first started campaigning on the tar sands in around 2007, um, everyone thought that I was, um, that I was talking about Tar Sands and Jane, the movie. Um, so people didn't know what the word Tar Sands was at the time. And so it was a little bit of heavy lift to just even get to know that we are in one of the biggest industrial um, projects on the face of the earth. And that's where I was born. And I was born in the left purple blotch of the peace, peace country. Um, and then there's Athabasca. And then so it's um, 141,000 square kilometers. Um, so it's a 
23% of the province that we're talking about um, fragmenting and destroying to get at this. Um, this is a, sorry, it's so, I'm um, a little bit blurred, but this is, we took this from the air. So this is when you're kind of flying over in either a helicopter or a small plane with photographers and um, looks like it's pixelated, but I really like this quote from Dr. David Schindler, who is an amazing ally and worked with many indigenous communities doing research before he passed from cancer. There is nothing on this planet that compares to the destruction going on there. If there are global prize for unsustainable development, the tar sands would be a true, the clear winner. And that's a really sad thing um, to be from that area and to, you know, this, it's, it's, this is what it normally looks like. So um, another photo that we took and the Peace Athabasca Delta, it's a beautiful, pristine inland water system, glacier fed, and it is being depleted and every, you know, right now, millions of cubic meters as we speak being pulled in and made to produce the tar sands, the dirtiest form of oil on the planet. And Research has shown, if you don't know this, the woodland caribou will be locally extinct from our territories by 2040, within our lifetimes. And so, as you can imagine, um, our way of life as indigenous peoples has been replaced by industrialized landscapes, polluted watersheds, and contaminated air. And we took this picture, that's the Athabasca region on the top, and, and the flyover, and this is from our territory, in Lubacan territory, and the piece um, with a massive pipeline build and flaring gas. So, I don't have time to show this video today, but if you are more interested in what it feels like to um, experience a massive oil spill beside your family and community's homes, that happened to our community in 2011 when I was a climate and energy campaigner at Greenpeace Canada, and it was a pretty traumatizing experience. So I do um, look it up, oil on Lubacan land, and that's you know family members and community members cleaning up the spill. It was 4.5 million liters, and and that was me 15 months later when the company said they had cleaned it up. And that's the kind of things we're still pulling out um, when it's clean and remediated. Um, so as you know, the TRC put out its recommendations and used this word and everyone was very aghast by it by, in 2015. But I think it's more you know, acknowledged and utilized now as a cultural and environmental genocide where we see encroachment, contamination, destructions of our homelands. And this is resulting continually still of loss of culture, traditions, and customs. And the reason why I do this work is because I was seven years old on a blockade in 1988 with my family and my community. And these are kids that, you know, they're finally my cousin's kids. Um, this is in Little Buffalo where I was born. And they were finally able to come out. This was taken about two and a half weeks after the spill when, because the community school was shut down for close to two weeks because people couldn't breathe, their eyes were burning, their stomachs were turning because of the noxious and fumes kind of wafing into the community from the close by oil spill. And so, you know, the this picture I just love having it in my presentation because it just reminds me of why I do the work that I do and why I haven't stopped for 20 years now. Um, but I really want to make this connection between violence against the land begets violence against women because as indigenous peoples, we see the earth as our mother and we call her mother earth for that reason that she sustains us, she gives us life. She gives us the very, you know, essence of who we are as, as all people, as all humanity. And, you know, we see this um, being torn away with colonial values of patriarchy capitalism, which is exploiting the land and exploiting our women and people. And that's connected to this issue that I also work on um, and have for the past decade of murdered and missing Indigenous women. And because of my sister's case being unsolved, Bella Lubbockan McLean here on the middle left area um, where she passed and her death is still unsolved. Um, and so all of this context of, you know, I think it's really important to contextualize why we do this work and why for me, I had to find a yes to the no, because for me, it got to the point where it was, you know, I think a lot of us do feel climate grief, climate anxiety, now that those words are out. I think as a climate and energy campaigner, when no one believed us that climate change existed, except for the people that actually believed 15 years ago, but you know, now people over Thanksgiving dinner, people believe <laughs> because they see it all over the news. Um, but we were gaslit for a long time doing that work. And so it's really good to be at a conference like this where we are seeing people making that change in their everyday lives and also productions. So this is my fr another production um, that we made. It's, um, so I'll show this next video here, but it's um, 
the my yes to my no was building. So I was, you know, saying stop, no, you know, traveling around the world, protesting, um, speaking out at different conferences, testifying against, uh, testifying in the U.S. Congress, um, speaking in British Parliament. Um, but it felt like it was, you know, I was blue in the face, and I was so frustrated, and I was so exhausted, and I was so angry because my family was still being poisoned, and I couldn't stop it. And that's traumatizing. Um, that's a really hard thing to go through when you see that happening and you have no power. So I thought to myself, what can I do to start rebuilding and start bringing in the, the what we actually want to see? There's this foreign imposition and we want to see the, the next, what's the next iteration of what communities are actually developing themselves. And it's coming from the community as opposed from, from the outside, which has happened for about 150 years in our community. A lot of it was foreign imposition. So uh, this project is called Pitapan, and I am going to, um, this is Carlton on the left, and we, uh, yeah, we, we trained him up in, to put up this project. And I'm going to show a really short video now. The Lubicon Cree have been here since time immemorial. Indigenous peoples have a very intimate connection with our homelands here in northern Alberta. And what we've seen instead is industry coming and essentially taking over our lands and really exploiting them and it's had a detrimental impact. We see companies digging down into the earth trying to extract the very last drop of oil. But instead, we can start looking up we're bathing in sunlight all around us and yet we don't utilize that energy and so that's why our community has decided to install solar project go up. A lot of the community members and the young people are working, they're getting hands-on training right now. It's really amazing to see how proud people are of it and how it's, it's a community project because all of this has been through the blood, sweat and tears of the community. Well, this project matters to us because it kind of represents who we are and where we're going in the future. When you see the work, you can, I can say that I did that. I took part and I did it right. So there will be a lot of people seeing it every day. I can tell people I worked on this. <laughs> I know uh, in a lot of the ceremonies and the songs, the sun is praised. You know, uh, even the project name, Pitapan, means the coming of the dawn. And it's coming of a new era, you know, era where we use uh, you know, energy that's not devastating to our environment. In uh, getting this solar project going, we are leaders in solar power, and that's what we're teaching our youth. You know, they have to learn how to operate it, they have to learn how to maintain it, and uh, they already know how to set it up. So if any, any of our neighbors in the surrounding First Nations or Métis settlements want to start a solar power, we can be there to help them get it going. That was the birth of Sacred Earth Solar, and that project went up in 2015. And, um, you know, the yes to the no is also returning to zero waste commun communities, and Indigenous peoples have always been zero waste. And so I think it's this kind of returning back that we see this acknowledgement in telefilm and all the different um, speeches and things that I've heard um, throughout the changing times of the years, the acknowledgement that Indigenous um, knowledge is valuable and it's integral to how we move forward in this country. Um, Tiny House Warriors, we put another project up in Sequetmic territory in Interior, BC. 
at Sacred Earth Solar. We also put up a project in Ontario in with Christy Belcourt and Isaac Murdoch, who are amazing artists in the Anishinaabe territory. We solarized their art studio in um, a few years back. We also um, solarized Gideon Dam Checkpoint, which is with Zoatin, um in northern BC. Um, Fairy Creek as well, and then our most recent just happened a few weeks ago. This is in Six Nations and um, with an organization called No More Silence. That's a Toronto-based organization that is working to make uh, healing lodges more accessible, um, wheelchair accessible, and also accessible to the LGBTQI plus A community, and also um, to murdered and missing Indigenous families that are struggling and looking for justice for their their family members. So another project I really wanted to show you and share with you that was a heavy lift of around two or three years with uh, Real World Media. Um, I know Carmen's speaking later today, and I think Diego is in the audience who helped edit this. It, Power to the People was, um, we went to 26 locations across the country, interviewed and profiled the communities that have implemented a renewable energy, eco-housing, food security, and talked about all of the problems that they were seeing in their communities and how they, the, as community members and champions um, transitioned and put solutions forward in their community. So I'm going to show this really quick. It's Kanaka Bar. And if you don't know where Kanaka Bar is, it's um, just by Lytton. So Lytton, BC, as everybody knows now, is the, the town that burnt down. And um, Kanaka Bar actually is putting, has put fire bans in and around their community to um, utilizing traditional knowledge to ensure that their community is safer to have those controlled burns before communities are consumed by forest fires. And so I'm going to show this, um, and they're talking, and they've been implementing a variety of different projects from energy sovereignty, food sovereignty, energy sovereignty. Um, so I'll, let, I'll play this quick video here. First things that we had going. Do you always wear these? Um, no, actually, these bees are really friendly. Amazing. Right now, they're um, filling it up with honey and making sure they're, they're getting ready for the winter time. So how many chickens do you have in here? We have 50, I believe. We started out with six and realized, um, you know, this is working. We can keep on growing and become a larger scale. So you have a student youth program. Can you tell me more about it and how many students that are currently in it? There's six, six oh, okay. students here. That's so great. So coming around the chickens here, hello ladies, we walk into our food forest. Wow. So you know, everything in our garden has a purpose, whether that's food or medicinal. Mm -hmm. um, these here are linden trees and they're actually one of the few trees that we can eat the leaves. It's beautiful up here. Yeah, absolutely. So this is echinacea, there's lots and lots of stuff. A large, large variety of plants. I'm going to say over 90 plants. You can really see the diversity here. The overall plan is that this food is a food forest and not necessarily a garden, so we don't have to have a lot of membership coming in, weeding, fertilizing. The general plan for this is to see, you know, what we can grow here and what's suitable to, you know, grow on a larger scale. And one of the main things are these strawberries that are going to remain growing here. Coming over here, you can see these guys working hard. It's our first adventure into creating a greenhouse. What we're creating here is called a solar thermal greenhouse. It's important that we use the solar thermal greenhouse because the extremities of the weather changes. So in the winter time it can get up to like minus 30 while in the summertime it can get beyond like 45 degrees Celsius. This is amazing. All in like one little plot of land. I'm so inspired by just the diversity of what you have here. Not even to mention you have we have solar in the background here we haven't even talked about so I'd love to hear more more about that when we get a chance. Yeah, I'll tell you all about it later. There's so much going on here. Yeah, so it's really exciting to see what communities are doing because um, when I started building my project, I kind of just did it trial and error because there was no like how-to um, guide to doing it. So I went back to do my master's and I focused on renewable energy. So the Pitapan project that started Sacred Earth Solar was based on my master's thesis. And then I became a part of a pro of an organization um, that I'm on the, the National Ste um, Steering Committee for it, Indigenous Clean Energy. And the research that's been put out is there's 
over 3,000 indigenous-led renewable energy projects across the country and 300 large-scale revenue-generating projects. But like, does anybody in the can anybody in the audience name any of them, or do does any? Okay, name one. Okay, name another one. He said, name them all. That's a company, though. What's the project? Uh, Holden Solar Project. Okay, what, another one. You said name them all, so. Okay, I know. No, I know, but you're just calling me out right now, so I just was like, okay, come do my job for me. No, I'm joking. Okay, anyways, anyways. Love you back. Love you back. I can't see who you are, but. I'm just going to say I love you for now. Um, Mi'kmaq, so the next project I want to show, this is just, just a short clip, but this is the Mi'kmaq wind farm in the Gaspizi, which is, you know, a huge area for wind. And uh, three Mi'kmaq communities decided to come together and build a project of 47 wind turbines. So it's a large scale revenue generating project. And so we we're able to interview some of the members that work on this project. It's so big. So how long have you both worked here for? Uh, about two and a half Great. years. And what did you do before for work? I worked in uh, on diesel mechanics, motors and stuff like that before, but then I went into the electrical field. So you basically transitioned from a non-renewable energy field to a renewable energy field. Yes. That's so cool. And you came from? Uh, I used to work in forestry. I did about five years in forestry. And I took a, an electrical course. Yeah. Uh, let us show you inside. OK, perfect. How tall is it? It's a 100 meter tower, 330 feet to the nacelle. Uh, right now, we're going to be working on this cabinet. Oh. Uh, we're actually going to be replacing a Bachman module, which is uh, essentially the brain of the turbine, so we can get communication with the turbine. So brain surgery, essentially. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the reason why we replaced this module is because there was no communication from the computer to the turbine, mm -hmm. so that's how we knew it was something to do with the module. So you're like wind doctors, essentially. So you have to make a prognosis and then fix it. My favorite thing about being up here is, is the view. If you take a look around, like it's amazing. Like you, you can see so far. We're 100 meters in the air right now. We always learn new things every day. What you do every day, it's pretty amazing to see the capacity or high level of skills that you're bringing to your nation. It's a, you must be pretty proud. And. Yeah, give it up for all the communities doing this heavy lift. Um, yeah, we could only visit 26 locations, and that's you know over 3,000. Like, can you imagine how we spent um, close to three years working on this project and just filming and you know going into community and interviewing and all the things that go into filmmaking, as you, everyone knows here. So um, this is the last quick one that I'll show you. But please, um, you can now access Power to the People on uh, the Weather Network. So if you go onto the channel, or if you go, or you can watch it on IPTN as well. Um, the Knowledge Network, but if you go on to the Weather Network website, you can actually access the, the videos there. So please, 13 episodes, they're jam-packed, 22 minutes long, and they just talk about a variety of issues, not only renewables, but also truth and reconciliation, murder and missing women, colonization, all of the things that communities are grappling with. So if you really want to you know, visit a community that you've never been to before, um, tune in. And this is the last one I'll show, and i got to move on to the next thing, but here we go. I had a decommissioned coal energy power plant, and now we're seeing solar being erected in its place. How do you feel about that? What's the story behind that? Ontario Power Generation uh, decommissioned Nanakoke Generating Station in 2013, and now Nanakoke Solar um, is actually taking place on the former coal yard of yeah. the Nanakoke Generating Station, and they're really transitioning, transitioning hey? into that greener energy. Even though we see a refinery in the background still pumping oil. I think we see this is like really the energy transition that we're all really hoping for and I think it's pretty inspiring that Six Nations is a part of it. So, um, 
one of the reasons why I came here is because I really do um, love the film industry and the film community um, being a part of it, especially I've been a, you know an indigenous media maker for close to 20 years. But I think sometimes when I watch movies, I think of all the explosions and all the things and all the things that are so unsustainable in the industry. And I think you know we really need to see urgent action. And that's why I was so honored to speak here, because I wanted to meet people like you um, that are also concerned about these issues. Um, I don't know if you've seen this stat, though. This stat shocked me a little bit. Um, it's a study done by UCLA. And for one soundstage, um, that can lead up to 900 sports, field, uh, sports fields of deforestation for a single sound, soundstage, so 4,000 4, hectares. And that's because of the, a lot of the use of unsustainable plywood is probably a lot of you know that. And I just found this kind of shocking. I had to put it in the presentation. Um, and also these figures from the Sustainable Production Alliance of the average temple film emits more than 33,000 metric tons of carbon. So, you know, there's, there's a, this is a big job that everyone's involved in, and I probably don't have to stress it too much in this, in this crowd, but I think, too, like a part of the film industry in Hollywood is it, film is about creating culture. It's about replicating culture. It's about creating new norms. It's about showing new stories. Um, and so I think that's one of the things around the responsibility and the social capital of, of this media. It has such a profound impact on our society. And so I think that's why we all also have such a responsibility as well be to actually push back against the throwaway culture that exists because of capitalism, unfortunately. Um, and so we really have to push back against the status quo of um, what, what we see that is happening, the once in a century heat waves, for, forest floods, fires, all the things that, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a major issue and people are apathetic and people are still doing the status quo when we need to be in response crisis right now. And I think that's the thing where we see 20% of young people um, thinking it's too late. And that's a sad thing. So we, you know, we talk about green storytelling, incorporating sustainability on on messages, but also I wanted to talk a little bit about indigenous storytelling and indigenous knowledge that should be included inside, on screen and off screen, because you know our voices have been silenced. There has been an erasure of history, and now more than ever, indigenous epistemology is so important to bring that understanding of reciprocity with the natural world. So. Elders have always told me repeatedly since I was a young person that what we do to the land, we do to ourselves. And so, you know, Indigenous world's view is that all life is sacred, that there is a reciprocity, there it is, is a relationality of our sacred responsibility to protect her. If we go out hiking, and we partake, if we drink that water, that is our sacred responsibility to not only benefit and enjoy, but also to protect. And that's, that's I think, sometimes what I see lacking in Western society. It's a different from a different indigenous understanding. Um, so some of the practices, I won't go too far into it because I think more people are probably better experts than I am, but I'm just loving to learn all of these things and some agree with some and don't agree with some and just wanted to give a little bit of feedback on some things, but you know, waste reduction, vendors, uh, materials, I won't go into that too much around best practices, electricity because of the GHG emissions, diesel power generators powering entire sets, a green writer, I found a really nice one online. Um, electric vehicles, this is this is the thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about, just because I think sometimes people think that when we connect to EVs, which are helpful, you know, we don't want to be utilizing diesel, yes, we want to reduce our GHG emissions, but sometimes, like say, an EV in Alberta is po being powered by coal, it's being powered by natural gas, you know, sometimes mega dams are also producing methane, and so we have to really think deeper than just saying a plug-in is going gonna, is gonna to solve everything, because that's not necessarily the case, it's not a one-size-fits-all, it's not a silver bullet, and I think sometimes we, ha we want that with climate change, but it's, it's, you know, like you know, it's heavy lifting, so we got to think pretty deep about these issues. Um, also, the carbon calculator, that's an amazing thing, but I think the carbon offsets is another thing that we really deeply have to question, and there's been a lot of research around that as well, um, that it doesn't guarantee a reduction in carbon emissions, and I think there needs to be a strong awareness, and I really did agree with um, Stephen Gubo, who I used to know when he worked at Equiterra and I worked at Greenpeace, but around this um, climate literacy and energy literacy, all of the kind of like net zero carbon offsets, um, just transition, there is not an agreed upon 
consensus exactly around all of those definitions. So a lot of times they're being utilized, greenwash co-opted, and so we have to be really careful around when we're agreeing to these things because sometimes they sound better than they are. Um, so this is you know, the expert list um, that um, I was able to go through and was just enthralled by all of it and just spent weeks reading it. Um, and I'm sure people have in this room as well. I'm looking forward to the workshops today. Um, but I also love this quote that Zena with the op-ed um, that she talks about around, do we want to be a business that can tell heroic stories about imaginary characters but can't step up when it's our own time, it's our own turn to act. And I really felt that was like very poignant for the motion production, motion picture industry. Um, and I do think, you know, there are some people, some leaders I've had been, been fortunate to work with, you know, um, Jane Fonda, Mark Ruffalo. Um, we were at the Just Look Up um, press conference, I think it was last year. I'm gonna show a quick video to close um, around just kind of continuing to push that narrative and not go with the status quo um, because we really have to think deeply about these issues um, and not take the one size fits all because that really doesn't exist right now. Um, and so I think doing the, re the, the really deep research um, that requires for all of us to kind of move forward in this, in this um, field. So I'm gonna show this comes from a campaign around divestment around No More Dirty Banks and we had about close to 75 um, Hollywood A-list actors sign on to this um, and it was, a, it was a campaign we launched last year. RBC, let's be clear, is financing the destruction of my homelands all the way to the Wet'suwet'en people's homelands. In this short period of time, the damage that they've done and what they plan to do is irreversible. It is what we do today that can change it. If you want to do something really important on climate change, Move your money away from where it's being spent to fund this. That's probably the most powerful thing we can do right now. So just to close, um, you know, I always like, sometimes heavy, I feel like I've, I've been kind of a doom and gloom storyteller for a long time because of seeing the future that's here with us now. But the future also for me looks like the healing of land, healing ourselves, you know, as Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples that occupy now what we call Turtle Island here in Canada. There's some, you know, a lot of work to be done. And so we're claiming our sacred connection as humans and our responsibility to protect Mother Earth is so critical even in this film work and I really think becoming the story the becoming the heroes of the story both on the big screen and in production so just wanted to say thank you for having me today hi hi Please thank you, join me and say thank you so much to Melina and thank you for your activism, your continued energy in this space and all of the advocacy work that you're doing.